I've set out on a journey of journeys, retracing the footsteps of my ancestors to discover more about their adopted homelands, looking for signs, connections and influences that have shaped me and my culture. years ago when I first began to really contemplate my ethnicity, my culture and my identity. Go to Malacca to document my very elderly relative's livelihood of fishing, which is a traditional I met people, I listened to stories and made my own discoveries. And I wrote a book in social studies class for the all girls convent of the Holy Infant Jesus of my experiences growing up and being Eurasian in Singapore. Six years on, in 2023, my book is republished. I realize I cannot call to mind a single name of a Eurasian dish in Kristam. But my journey to understand more about being Eurasian didn't end with the book. I still have unanswered questions, and there's more I'd like to learn and share. How did some of our, or maybe all of our Eurasian traditions originate? You know, what happens when two people from very different cultures come together? What traditions that each of them bring into this union remain? Are any traditions discarded or um, are new traditions created? Life for Eurasians of generations past seemed to revolve around religion, family, sport, and the arts, and of course, cuisine. I'm also reminded that many Eurasians left their mark on society and made important contributions. A community between two worlds with mixed ancestries and hybrid identities. A culture formed from colonization, immigration, and adaptation. But how much of that culture persists amongst today's younger Eurasians? Okay, so now we have all these pieces out, and what we need to do is to cut off the the the, the thing in the middle. My mom calls it. Perot. Wesley Aruzu right. never had a very strong sense of being Eurasian when he uh, was growing up. He didn't have any Eurasian friends in school and never really felt connected to the Eurasian community. But he does know how to make pickles, Eurasian style. So it was your mum's pickle business, right? She mm -hmm. was actually selling these pickles? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. So she's been doing it for 40 years. And four it's zero. Four, four years, yeah, which is exactly the, my age as well. Okay. So she took it up when, when I was kind of like born. What inspired her to start it? Mm. So it was passed down through generations, right? Oh. So and when my grandmother had to migrate to Australia, um, her customers were asking like, hey, who's going to continue it now? So my mom con decided to continue it. I think there were two reasons. So one is to preserve the Eurasian delicacies. And the other reason I think is because of me actually. So with me being the third child, that brought a bit of financial constraints, I guess, to the family too. So making pickles and selling them in a small home-based kind of business kind of helped with the family financially as well. Okay, cucumber and carrots that need this all. You always do it one by one with these tongs. I also wonder whether this will continue down to me and my sister as well. And we learned a little bit, but not everything, not enough to continue it. So it's a bit scary as well because if it skips this generation, then it might be lost forever. And I think there's a lot of things going on with a lot of this Eurasian um, delicacy. Um, with the new generation being maybe a bit more um, reluctant or not as interested to take it up. And if they don't, then a lot of these interesting family recipes will soon disappear. Yeah, exactly. So these are some family photos I managed to find. 
They are obviously not digital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are quite weathered. But um, okay, like I wanted to show you this one because I think it's very interesting. It's probably the oldest photo that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my mom's side of the family. Uh, these are my mom's grandparents, uh, Maria and Victor. So uh, apparently or allegedly, um, he came from Goa. So he, he looks, I mean, you can tell like the Indian heritage is quite strong. Yeah, so back then, the Eurasian community would live in specific areas, right? And they would be rather close-knit. Then, of course, it's very different now. We're all spread out around Singapore. And you know, since we're only about 0.4% of the population, it's really common, I think, for many Eurasians to go the whole day without seeing another Eurasian that maybe isn't their family member, right? So I'm curious, Wesley, when you were growing up, did you feel a strong sense of Eurasian identity or was it something you couldn't really relate to? I had zero Eurasian friends in primary school and in secondary school because there were no other Eurasians except for me. So uh, it was interesting. Um, uh, because of this, I think I was a little bit more um, disconnected from the Eurasian community because I had lesser interaction with Eurasians. Um, also living in a community with lesser Eurasians, my dad grew up in a place where there were Eurasian neighbours, mm -hmm. right? So it's very different for me living in a HDB where there's a whole diverse uh, racial group as well. Yeah. So lots of pros um, and cons as well, but um, yeah, lots of love as well. Given that experience of yours, Wesley, what would you now want to find out about your Eurasian history and heritage? Wow, so much because a lot of my heritage is a bit of a mystery. So for example, my surname is Aruzu, A-R-O-O-Z-O-O. -O -O. But over time, he has been either misspelled or ch had a change of spelling. And original spelling is actually A-R-U-J-O, which is Arroyo. Right? So if you go to Portugal, you'll be able to find that name there, but not Aruzu. So because of that, it's, tried, it's quite hard to find the history of Aruzu because it's quite a short timeline. Um, but I think in my own way, I've been trying to find a way to connect back to my history. For example, in Singapore, there's Aruzu Lane and Aruzu Avenue, which is really intriguing because, hey, that's my surname, right? It's a bit different. So I wanted to find the old heritage signs, the old street signs of Aruzu Lane. So here it is. Um, this is the signage. Let me bring it over. So it's a bit huge. Wow. So it says Aruzu Lane. Look at that. Yeah. That's very impressive. Wesley's not the only one searching for his roots. I am too. I thought I'd start with a visit to a district in Singapore, Bras Basa. Once home to many Eurasians, when the Eurasian community started to emerge here in the 19th century. Soon after Singapore was founded, uh, many Eurasians lived around this area, partially because they were working around this area. And those, especially of Portuguese descent, would come here because this was the Portuguese mission. Other types of Eurasians who may not have been Portuguese would be going to the cathedral just down the road. And this holds a very special place for many of us who are of Portuguese descent. I know um, my great-grandfather, my grandfather and my father were all baptised here. Many of the younger generation of Eurasians today may not feel so connected to their Eurasian identity and their culture. So in your opinion, Alexius, what are some of the reasons for this? I think especially after independence, there was a period where many of us felt that our main identity should be Singaporeans uh, rather than Eurasians. Um, they grew up with a sense that we are Singaporeans first. But I do feel that some of them, especially as they grow older, will start to think about who they are, where they came from, uh, what our families used to do, what our history was. We are a blend of East and West, which Singapore is as well, culturally. Um, we are also very hybrid and very proud about being hybrid. We have Portuguese, Dutch, British, Chinese, Malay, Indian ancestry. and. We, we, we just don't see differences among each other and we don't see much differences with other races as well. I don't have hard proof, but I do believe that many Eurasians are intermarrying with other races and that's a good thing. But I think if you ask me, statistically speaking, if you look at the census, in the last 10 years, the, the overall numbers of Eurasians in Singapore has actually increased. So I think we really 
found our home here. So for Eurasians today, Alexius, who are interested in finding out more about their Eurasian heritage, their culture, and also for people who are not Eurasian, who would like to learn more about our culture, how would you recommend they go about this? I would strongly recommend through our Eurasian cuisine, our dishes, and our most emblematic one will be Deba, also known as Devil's Curry, and also the Suji Cake. Once you get into them, you will know everything you need to know about being Eurasian. My quest to learn more about my culture and identity as a Eurasian lands me in an unlikely part of Singapore, Sentosa, a holiday island of the city. It also happens to be the site for one of a small handful of establishments in Singapore, serving the cuisine Eurasians have been eating for generations. Quentin Pereira, a fellow Eurasian, learned the recipes from his mom, dad, grandparents, and other Eurasian relatives and acquaintances. Quentin's The Restaurant is his ode to Eurasian cuisine and his labor of love to preserve it. Today we're having s'more, pot roast beef, and curry debal, just three dishes. Enough to taste and understand the vast diversity of Eurasian ancestries and influences. So traditionally, yes, we pork and beef together. Mm. For the small, mm. it's actually like a Dutch and English influence. But I would think that it's more Dutch when they were here, and then uh, because we use uh, a lot of Asian. Uh, Ingredients like ginger, onions, you know, things like that, and then with all the spices, cinnamon, cloves, star anise. And then uh, the pot roast beef is uh, English, we derive from pot roast, but we use a lot of onions and chaga sauce, which the English won't use. And then the bal, I, I was brought up knowing that. The bal means leftovers, okay? and it was made on Boxing Day after Christmas, and with all the meats that is available. Do you think all the mixtures and amalgamations in Eurasian cuisine reflect Eurasian culture? I would agree with you because the term Eurasians itself, you see, the Eurasians can be of uh, Portuguese descent, can be of uh, Dutch descent can be of English descent, but can also be of German descent. Can, can, it, it is so wide. Most Eurasians in Singapore might not be able to trace their Portuguese ancestries as far back to Portugal itself. But many have roots in a city in Malaysia, Malacca, that for 130 years was an outpost of the Portuguese Empire. The Portuguese were the first to arrive in Asia in the 16th century. Malacca would later be colonized by the Dutch, then the British. There are tangible remnants of the Portuguese presence here, but it is the intangible heritage that connects Eurasians of Portuguese descent everywhere. What's all that Oh, yeah, it's you know, used to, uh, you feel Yeah, sticky. yeah, but it's fun. Luckily, today got no, not much of a way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In Malacca, many of my Portuguese Eurasian brethren made their homes by the sea. Many were fishermen. Martin Tessera is an advocate for the Portuguese community in Malacca. 
he's fished these waters for nearly 20 years. So I could survive as a fisherman, could sustain myself. I mean, I had a father, I supported my father, I supported some of my siblings. A bit tough in that sense, but if you're hardworking, you should be able to make ends meet. Yeah, no, really. But so, you loved it. Oh, really, really. Loved I love that part of my life where I went fishing and I had no worries at all. My father used to say, his wife is his first love, and the sea is his other love. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Obviously, being a seafaring community, there's always this connection of the people and the sea. And they are like isi dengan kuku, they are one. You can't separate isi the two. Isi dengan kuku, what's that? Mean? Okay, it's like the nail and the flesh. Ah, you you okay, can't separate okay. the two. So it's intertwined. Fishing was a natural source of, I would say, work or livelihood, you know, for the people. Mm. Being a seafaring community from a seafaring country like Portugal. So it was a natural attraction. But the economic attraction to the sea and fishing is waning. In the last decade, Malacca's waterfront has altered from land reclamation projects designed to boost the state's economy. And the reclaimed land has had an impact on marine life and to the livelihoods of Malacca's fishermen. It really took the soul of you know, the place, and people slowly start to leave the place. In the old days, they could get a much bigger catch. But because of the land reclamation today, this is all we got. Saudade, a Portuguese word that has no English equivalent. It describes a feeling of longing, melancholy, or nostalgia. Saudade perfectly sums up what was to be a bittersweet boat ride. It made me see how closely tied the values and ideals of this community are to their livelihoods. Livelihoods practiced for generations, but now in jeopardy of being rendered obsolete. And later, a discovery of a different sort. The fisherman we rode with, Ronnie Di Mello, reveals I am a distant relative. Ronnie, yeah. you are a Di Mello. Do you think that we are related? Yeah, okay. my mother's side. Oh, your mother's side? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you, my dad is the cousin of Uncle Maurice Pereira, yeah. who you all call Boy. Mm. Does You're that side. make us related? Are you related to Uncle Maurice? No, my uncle. Uncle he's, Maurice is your uncle? Yeah, he's... Uh, and my mother, brothers and sister. Uncle Maurice is the brother of your mom? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's really... He's your direct yeah, uncle? Yeah, okay. direct uncle. Ah, and so Uncle Maurice is also my dad's cousin. Oh, so we are we, definitely yeah, related. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Long. I don't know. Very small. Very, very small, small world, settlement. Huh? It's yeah. a very small settlement. Yeah, small world. Small world. Come on. Good, ah. Uh, yeah, well, relative. Yeah. <laughs> cousins. Cousins. We are cousins. How do you say cousin in Christian? Ah, Rajiri Sang. In Malacca, I'm on a search for more connections to discover how the culture of my ancestors emerged. I meet Stephanie Pile who has Portuguese, Malaccan and Indian ancestry. Curious now, to your knowledge, did these groups of Eurasians of different heritages from the European side get along? Okay, so we, have, we don't have anything on record, but of course family stories, um, you know, I wouldn't say like they were not getting along, okay, but in most likelihood they kept, maybe they kept apart, right? Uh, however, I, I think, looking at family history or like say my own family history, for sure we can say that, let's say someone from Dutch heritage, they would have uh, somebody of Portuguese descent in their family. Yeah, so the mix is there, even though the surnames may not, may not you know, uh, definitely say that, oh, there's Portuguese blood in their, in their family. Is Kristang still widely spoken in Malacca? 
Chinese. You still have the older community, those like perhaps 50 and above, who still speak it fluently. However, with the younger generation, like the children, for example, you find that most of them um, use English as a dominant language uh, and almost their own brand of English, which is quite um, kind, of, kind of parked on top of Kristang. My worry is what will happen when the older generation passes on, you know. Um, who's going to pass this language on to the younger generation if parents are not speaking to their children in Malacca Portuguese? I have a question I've been dying to find out. Do you know what is the meaning of Debal, as in Debal Kari? You know, is it a Kristan word or from another language and what does it mean? That's a million dollar question, right? Um, I mean, some people say that it means, you know, leftovers and so on, but honestly, I've not found any evidence of that. Uh, and then it became anglicised into devil curry, right? Um, because of the spiciness and so on. So we don't know what the actual origin of devil is, if you ask me, yeah. This is the village where most of Malacca's Orang Portuguese live. The Portuguese settlement was set up in 1933 by Jesuit missionaries. Ties within the community are strong. You know, you know it's one, two, three, four, five, six, right? You know the numbers in English, you know the numbers in Malay. Now you learn in Kusan, Bahasa, Portuguese, Malacca. Ah, it didn't take much for Sarah Santa Maria to convince parents here to send their children for Kristang lessons. It all started from my father because in um, 1986, when he retired, he started to document the language. He also didn't want his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren to forget the language. But I think God had a better plan for him. In December 2008, he passed away. Then uh, in 2012, I started my class to teach the Portuguese, the Kristang language, yeah. So it's just started in 1511 when the sailors came here, they brought this language. When the Portuguese came here, they did not come directly from Portugal. They stopped in Goa and from Goa also they picked up a few languages from there. So it's can't say it's the language that came from Portugal, you see. Because there are many, many types of language in the Christian language. Okay. Those they can speak a little bit, it's also good enough. Where they can speak with the, the, the grandmother, you know? <laughs> they also have to remember their mother tongue. Not, no, don't forget the mother tongue, the Christian language. Bongasadi Maria, Marina, Tengbong? Tengbong Jo. Ki sorti? Yo sonomi Jo. Ki bo sonomi? Yo sonomi N. Yo alegri e kontra kum bos en? Bos kere kofi? Fudi. Jo. Is the bos a kofi? Mr. Merci. These are the typical ingredients we use to make our curry devil. I wanted to meet Martin de Serra again. We put all those wrap. This time to partake in one tradition that is very much alive among Malacca's Portuguese community. Eurasian cuisine has been successfully preserved, thank goodness. Martin is a very sought after curry devil cook who makes his spice paste the traditional way. Grinding with the pilang uh, tremper or the batu giling, I think will add a bit to its flavour. Whereas a commercial blender will just blend without any heart or soul. <laughs> you want to give it a try? Yes, please. Okay. It's all yours. Okay. Mm -hmm. I love this colour. Okay. Feels like it's more work than a food processor. But uh, it feels satisfying. Like, I think you know, a hard day, then you got a lot of frustration, you can take it out. You know, you make, you make a good curry uh, because of your frustration. It, oh, yeah. it feels like a good workout, you know? 
I think uh, that's great. <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing great. Okay, All right. very kind. Just, just right. Mm. Just because it's a bit coarse, so just give it an extra fry. But basically, table was a luxury dish those days to have mm -hmm. it put on the table. So basically, we had sambal fish or sambal sotong or sambal prawn, which is a vegetable. Mm -hmm. And it was nutritious enough. And that is actually what was our main diet. Chicken actually, like I said, was a luxury dish. So it was usually prepared for special occasions like Christmas, like weddings. But I think it's also synonymous with the community. And it's also something that is so versatile that you can even add other meats to it. You know, you can also add ham, bacon, sausage uh, into it. And it gives it a different flavor. Just give it a stir fry. So there's so many variations. We have variations from Penang and KL and Singapore. So in Malacca, it's just uh, potato. And basically for me, it's chicken. Debao, an enigmatic dish of no recorded origins, but one which continues to unite the Christian community and in Singapore, Eurasians of different colonial ancestries. And the vinegar. A dish that demonstrates the history of Eurasians. Add a little bit of mustard seeds towards the end. A reminder of the ingredients that sparked waves of colonization. Now, black sauce just to give it a bit more flavor. A metaphor for hybrid community shaped by a myriad of influences. Martin, despite the reclamation of the seafront uh, in the Portuguese Malacca community here, despite the dwindling use of Kristang in the home and in the community, are you hopeful that the younger generations will continue? Uh, the Portuguese Eurasian culture through some kind of revitalization effort? I mean, it's not all doom and gloom. Mm. I mean, we, we are survivors. We have been around for the last 500 years, and I'm mm. sure if we just have to put a bit of extra effort in trying to preserve this community, I think we can be around for the next 500 years. The community is, is a very versatile community. We have people in many professions, from pilots to doctors to engineers to lawyers to, med to even judges. We have fishermen, we have musicians, we have cuisine chefs. So actually we are all over the place and I'm sure God is on our side. Yeah. And uh, with a little bit of, well, fervent prayer, I think he will see us through. Yes. Sorry, Alice. Wow. Martin, there's only one word to describe this, which is... Sabroso. 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 Multimese, senor. You are most welcome. So I have just said to Martin that this dish is delicious. The Christian word Sabroso and Martin has said thank you in Christian. Mutumrese. It has been an honour to um, be here to witness you cooking this dish and sharing this dish with us, your precious family recipe, Martin. It was my privilege to have you on board and accompany me in this dish, special dish of the Christian South Malacca. Thank you. Before I leave Malacca, a special treat from my new friends. They're doing a dance, traditionally performed on the shoreline, to welcome fathers home from fishing voyages. I came to Malacca to learn more about my roots as a Eurasian. I leave with mixed feelings. I am pained that fishing, the livelihood of my ancestors, practiced for centuries, is nearing extinction. But I'm happy to feel a sense of familiarity and even kinship with the Portuguese Malaccan community. 
Strong enough for me to believe that while my ancestors left Malacca for Singapore, they did take a bit of the spirit of the community with them. But there's still one part of the Eurasian story I'm curious about. I make a trip to Kuala Lumpur to learn more about a branch of my family tree from a place I know very little about. Sapna Anand is an authority on Goan cuisine. Goa, another Portuguese colony, is where to my knowledge, my great-grandfather came from. Start with some oil. Sapna is making vindalu. The paste goes into the mutton. This is a dish that could be a distant cousin to curry debal. It's hard to trace the genealogy of both dishes. It was the 16th century after all when they came to be. You can see the juices from the meat. You cannot rush cooking. You cannot rush cooking. So good. It smells amazing. So there were Portuguese colonies in India, Malaya and Macau in this part of the world. Do you think that there would have been an exchange of culinary ideas and influences between these three places? It's very hard to really go down to the source and tell it like this specifically came from here or there. If you look at it, it could have also been and uh, inter, inter, you know, exchange. There was so much movement back and forth from spice trade, from different different trades. So there were Portuguese um, settle uh, would would take back people back from communities back from India to the Malaya region and back from Malaya to India too. So movement is so much. They, it's a high possibility there was a lot of ideas that came in from Malaya from that region for us. And same way that went back to Malaysia and you know th th that region. So everywhere they travel, they left a mark, mm. and they carried back. We would say a gift, yes. culinary gift, where we can all enjoy different cuisines that was influenced by influenced by the Portuguese. Yeah. I'm on a journey to discover more about my roots. My visit to Malacca helped me reconnect with the traditions of my ancestors and pushed me to look deeper for more influences that might have shaped my culture and identity. I'm setting my sights on another Asian city where many a Eurasian family tree might have branched from, including mine. to the vast, verdant landscapes of Goa. A former Portuguese outpost colonised a year before Malacca in 1510. I've come to a remote enclave where spirits are created. Those that were the tipple of choice for the Portuguese who arrived and administered the colony. The locals adopted the religion, language and culture of their colonial rulers and Feni as their beverage. Hansel Vaz used to be a geologist before becoming a master distiller of Feni. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a far change. I mean, if you're a geologist, you're looking at rocks. Uh, I prefer having a feni on the rocks. <laughs> a feni on the rocks, how nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
this the coconut vinegar? Coconut okay. vinegar. Hansel has picked quite the spot for my first taste of Fenny. So interestingly, before the Portuguese came, we were already distilling coconut Fenny. So we distilled only coconut because it's the most abundant crop. But what the Portuguese did was they brought a very interesting fruit from the Amazon, from the forests of the Amazon, from Brazil, all the way to Goa. And we created a spirit called Cashew Fenny. And this is the only place that they did it. They didn't do it in Brazil, they didn't do it in Africa, not in Southeast Asia, only Goa. Cajou feni. Cajou feni is totally different. It's so smooth. Smooth, yeah. It's, so, it's like velvet. Very well, yeah. I didn't realize this was going to be sweet. So, um, feni is intrinsically linked in, in culture when it comes to celebrations. From a feast, a feast like John the Baptist where everyone um, celebrates, so it's, a, it's a huge part. For, for funerals, you can, you, you, the, the professional veilers who would be crying and creating the mood of the funeral will always have a fenis. It is a part of the fabric of life in Goa. Yes, yes. Uh, in other words. You, you cannot be Goan if you don't have a bottle of feni in your bar. <laughs> okay. okay. Shall I try one? Yes. Okay. Mm. So it's got diced meat, a little spicy. Beautiful. Yeah. It's gorgeous. So Hansel, I'm wondering how did the arrival of the Portuguese in Goa change uh, life in Goa? When we've got an assimilation, because we were with the Portuguese for 450 years, we kind of not just, we embraced the culture. So we, in our food, in the way we conducted ourselves, the way we celebrated feasts, uh, and we call it, the, in simple words, we, we became susegad. What is that? Susegad is a nice Portuguese word which means content with life. You're happy. Yes, yeah. Cool. You're not going, there's no rat race in Goa. You're enjoying your life, yeah. That is gorgeous. I'm very happy for you all. <laughs> Susegad, according to experts, refers to a contented, perhaps quiet form of Jua de Vide, which permeates life in Goa. My great-grandfather, or at least his parents, are believed to have lived here in Goa. And I wonder how life was like at the height of Portuguese times. Odette? Hi! Hi! I'm Melissa. Finally. Oh, finally, nice yes. to see you. Nice to see you. Mm. You're doing the Portuguese style? Yes, three times. All right. Okay. Shall we? Sure. Oh, you see the food. This used to be like that. Odette Mascarenhas is an author with an interest in cuisine, especially from her Goan heritage. She shows me a draft of her new cookbook. Their descriptions of ingredients closely intertwined with the reasons why Goa was so prized by the Portuguese. Except for the monsoons, I think the climate and the weather was absolutely fantastic, eight months of the year. So you had a lot of these uh, caravels coming in and a lot of this things moving up and down Goa. I think it was very, very strategically located. Okay. Do you think there were descendants of the Portuguese settlers and the Goan women back then? 450 plus years, uh, a lot of change can happen. So I will say yes and I will say no. There is a secret uh, thing to say, or not a really secret, but unspoken thing to say that Vasco de Gama promised his men marriage with a local woman and a plot of land so that they could settle down, uh, you know, and be happy. Uh, one must also take into consideration that later on there was a lot of conversion, so that uh, the lot of local Indian men took in these names, like mine also, the Mascarenas, and uh, decided to be, you know, settle down under that Luso style of living. The Portuguese administered Goa for 450 years, only leaving in 1961, 14 years after the formation of the Republic of India. But the legacy of the Portuguese era is hard to miss. It seems imprinted on the culture and the cuisine. It was the Portuguese traders who introduced spices to India, including the now ubiquitous chilies. 
so transforming the palates of the people of India and most of Asia forever. Vasquito Alvarez is a passionate promoter of Go and Cuisine and a top chef in the city. The cuisine is a confluence of cultures, a metaphor for the diversity of the Goan people and their multitude of influences. Vasquito! Hello, welcome. Hi! Nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Just in time for lunch. I can't wait. Vasquito's brought me three dishes. Two of them have striking similarities to Eurasian dishes from Malacca and Singapore. Prawn bao chao, a slightly tangier version of sambal prawns. Made with fresh prawns. Sarpotel, like fing, made with innards. Which is made with a, a mix of uh, pork meat and offal biscuit. Yeah. And vindaloo, which according to some writers, has similarities to curry debal and the distinct flavour of vinegar. Oh, thank you. Looks beautiful. So I think we used a lot of vinegar in Goan cuisine because we, uh, we have a long uh, monsoon. There's a shortage of everything, basically. So we used to create dishes that we could store for a longer time. It's a souring agent, but it also preserves the food. So this came from the Portuguese. The Portuguese would travel from Portugal to India by ship. So they would carry meats along with them in barrels and they would uh, marinate it with garlic and wine. So it took months to reach here. So by the time it got here, that wine had already turned to vinegar. So I think that's how the whole uh, concept of vinegar as a preservative came into Goa. What do you think Indian food would be without the influence of the Portuguese? It's difficult to imagine actually. I, I can't imagine uh, food without chilli and without tomato. And every Indian uh, dish has got tomato in it. And chilies, obviously. India is known, India is known for chilies. Yeah. And chilies are not indigenous from here. They came in from Mexico. Why do you think there may be some similarities in certain dishes in the former Portuguese outposts? For instance, Goa, uh, Malacca, Macau even. Because uh, there were a lot of Goans who went out of Goa to work in other colonies. So they probably took dishes from Goa to the other colonies. Every colony has got the same dish with differences in flavours because of the ingredients available in each country. But the similarities are there for sure. I'm taken in by the quiet sense of contentment that continues to define the Goan way of life. My ancestors might have left a bit of that fondness for Susegad in me. There is another distinctive characteristic of Goan culture I've been told about. It has to do with relations between the city's diverse population. In a secluded spot in South Goa lies probably the oldest residence in the city. Built in 1590, the sprawling interiors contain well-used and now priceless artifacts from the 17th century. At the height of Portuguese rule, this ballroom was the place to be for the who's who of Goan society. The main dining room of the house, not used on a daily basis, but used... Fatima is the current heir and caretaker to the home. The home, by decree of her great-grandfather, is to be passed down through the generations and never sold. And I was very young when I, I came the last time during the Portuguese ruling Goa and everybody's more vibrant, everybody was, uh, you know, people visiting each other, people going and having uh, uh, dinner parties and uh, uh, different from now. It was very, um, you know, like Susegad, like we used to say. The Goans are very well known because they love to dance and... Uh, Figueiredos were originally Hindu and converted to Catholicism like many families during Portuguese rule. Still, parties here would draw in congregations of Goans, including Portuguese officers and locals of every creed. In Goa, we always had a very good relationship in all the faiths. 
We, we never had divisions between people. We feel like friends, everybody. And uh, that's why we had all these people around us till today. That's wonderful. My journey ends here. And while I haven't found the exact origins of Kari De Bao, I have learned much else about my roots as a Singaporean Eurasian. I've discovered striking similarities in the cuisines of the places my ancestors came from with the heritage recipes I have grown up with at home. I've also been inspired by the cultures I have visited. They embody that hybridity of being European and Asian at the same time. A concept familiar to me and fellow Eurasians in Singapore. And what about that way of life defining joie de vivre? Sous garde is a feature that doesn't seem foreign to me at all. I won't be able to trace my ancestral roots across the 450 or so years of colonization. But what I do know is a strong sense of connectedness to the culture, the values, and achievements of my ancestors. We have, all of us, come a long way.